century, Sephardim still outnumbered Ashkenazim three to two. The Ashkenazic high point came in 1931 when they constituted nearly 92% of world Jewry. Ethnohistory repeatedly documents the amplification of a small subset of precursor DNA in modern Jewish populations, the inevitable loss of many Israelite haplotypes altogether and the introduction of large amounts of non-Israelite DNA. Such ethnohistoric data resoundingly repudiate critics' assumptions that modern Jewish populations represent a comprehensive and valid control of the genetics of ancient Israel. Dr. Robert Pollack further observed, Though there are many deleterious versions of genes shared within the Ashkenazi community, there are no DNA sequences common to all Jews and absent from all non-Jews. There is nothing in the human genome that makes or diagnoses a person as a Jew. Ethnohistoric and genetic data demonstrate that modern Jewish populations cannot possibly contain all of the genetic material present in predispersion Israel, and that few modern Jewish haplotypes are even plausible candidates for ancient Israelite origin. Well, some critics have claimed that, that the DNA similarities between modern Native Americans, Mongolians, and Siberians discredit LDS teachings, I find just the opposite. The consistency between genetics, history, scripture, and modern patriarchal blessings is remarkable. Genetic data provide no evidence that the haplotypes shared among modern Native Americans, Mongolians, and Siberians were present in Mongolia or Siberia prior to the dispersion of Israel. Genetic data also suggests that the prevalence of these haplotypes may have increased significantly over time in East Asian populations. Almost nothing is known about the genetics of ancient Israel. The prophet Jeremiah wrote that the 10 tribes had been dispersed to the lands of the north, a designation for which few lands seem as appropriate as the vast steppes of Siberia and Mongolia. Well before Mr. Murphy's criticisms of traditional LDS views hit the popular press, I had confirmed from missionaries and members that LDS patriarchal blessings have identified members of all of the tribes of Israel in Mongolia, a greater number than I am aware of being found in any other country to date. These blessings were given independently by patriarchs in stakes throughout the world where ethnic Mongolian missionaries served, as Mongolia had no stakes or patriarchs at the time. More recently, a similar phenomenon has been reported from Siberia. A recently returned missionary from the Russian Novosibirsk mission wrote, while there, I had the unique opportunity to be present for the coming of two American patriarchs who delivered the first ever patriarchal blessings to the Siberian saints on two separate occasions. What turned up was a staggering number of representatives of every single tribe in the relatively few blessings given. My research into patriarchal lineage declarations has consistently found a strong correlation between specific tribal lineages and certain ethno-national groups. While this does not offer any kind of scientific proof, it should at least open our minds to consider the possibility of a common origin for Native Americans and many modern Mongolians and Siberians outside of East Asia, perhaps in ancient Israel. One wonders if at least some elements of the genetics of these groups may not represent the genetics of ancient Israel better than modern Jewish populations, which have extensively assimilated the genes of their neighbors. The only part of the data that has not yet been explained in harmony with the Book of Mormon story is the timing. Many scientists date the genetic divergence of Native Americans as having arisen from migrations between 10,000 and 15,000 BC, rather than shortly after 600 BC, as stated in the Book of Mormon account. <clears throat> Mitochondrial DNA studies of the, the settling of the Americas have, read, have led to vastly different time estimates. And Gibbons reports, all this disagreement prompts Stanford University linguist Dr. Joseph Greenberg to simply ignore the new mtDNA data. He says, every time it seems to come to a different conclusion. I've just tended to set aside the mtDNA evidence. I'll wait until they get their act together. <laughs> Martin Tanner explains, the idea that haplogroup X has been in the Americas for 10 to 35,000 years is based solely on the assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg equ equilibrium, which include completely neutral variants, no mutation, no migration, constant near-infinite population size, and completely random mate choice. 
In the Book of Mormon account, most of the Hardy Weinberg assumptions are inapplicable. The wilderness journey, the ocean voyage, and the colonization of the New World result in patterns of genetic selection and DNA migration different from that found in Lehi's home environment. Closely related individuals married, and we are dealing with, initially, a very small group, not a nearly infinite population, which would dramatically alter DNA marker distribution and inheritance over time. If we take these assumptions about haplogroup X instead of the Hardy Weinberg assumptions, haplogroup X could have been introduced in the Americas as recently as one to 2,000 years ago, far less than the 10 to 35,000 years under the Hardy-Weinberg assumptions. Geneticist Mark Seelstad and colleagues note some of the problems with early dating. Our results do not contradict earlier studies of DNA in the autosomes whose standard errors were large and whose authors gave several reasons to expect their dates to overestimate the timing of the first human arrivals into the Americas. In addition, a more recent time of entry makes the proposal of the Amerind language family more plausible, or conversely, given the rapidity of linguistic change, the existence of a unified Amerind family would itself imply a fairly recent settling of the Americas, as we have suggested here. While consensus science still date, dates the peopling of the Americas well before the Lehites, dating methods depend highly upon assumptions that may not be universally valid and have a wide margin of error. Many estimates of the time of settling of the Americas have been shortened greatly in recent years. Time will tell whether current estimates will hold or whether continued revision may be required. Whatever one's beliefs on the DNA issue, critics attacks on LDS scripture for describing Native Americans as Lamanites can only be considered hypocritical when these people continue to be erroneously referred to as Indians more than five centuries after Columbus. The pseudoscientific term Amerindian used by Mr. Murphy does not get around the problem that Native Americans are not Indians at all. Even the terms Native Americans and indigenous peoples are problematic as migrations from a homeland in the Eastern Hemisphere are acknowledged by Latter-day Saints and Gentile scholars alike. For modern mixed populations, the terms Latino and Hispanic are based entirely upon the European admixture while conveying nothing about pre-Columbian origins. While the word Indian was used on many occasions by Joseph Smith and other early church leaders, this term does not occur in LDS scripture at all. Perhaps the use of the term Lamanite reflects the fact that their creator understood their origins in a way that most scientists still do not. When I was in medical school, physicians believed that hormone replacement therapy, or HRT, provided substantial cardiac benefits with no increase in cancer risk to the average postmenopausal woman. Numerous, seemingly well-designed, large-scale studies had corroborated these findings. While conducting public health research in an Eastern European country, I was informed by a local cardiologist that they did not use HRT because of the belief that it increased cancer risk. At the time, I felt that his society was primitive for harboring views in opposition to abundant medical literature. Yet more recent U.S. studies have concluded that traditional HRT regimens incur significant cancer risks while failing to provide cardiovascular benefits, leading to sweeping reversal of prior teachings that had served as the basis for the medical care of millions of women. The initial HRT studies were much more rigorous than many ethnohistoric and anthropologic studies, which draw from far fewer data points. <clears throat> Many other examples could be cited of theories once widely considered to have been rigorously proven, which have been almost completely repudiated by subsequent data. Almost every year brings unanticipated findings that require drastic revision of existing theories. Most individuals would be surprised to learn how few data points current consensus theories for the peopling of the Americas, such as the Bering Land Bridge theory, are based upon, and how many scholars in the field hold widely different views. Recent archaeological finds in South America that appear to be older than those in North America have led some scholars to champion the Pacific colonization theory, while others believe that the data are too sparse to settle the debate. It is fascinating to consider not only how frequently consensus science has changed its pronouncements, but the societal amnesia that leads each new theory to be proclaimed as fact as definitively as those it supplanted. While the real experts acknowledge the limitations of their data and theories, the popularization of such theories often overextends their mandates. One observant cartoonist quipped, my opinions may have changed, but not the fact that I am right. <laughs> 
the innate human desire for answers has always led to overextended conclusions in the face of inadequate evidence. Few individuals are able to acknowledge multiple feasible possibilities or to defer judgment until better data becomes available. The real test of our insight as scientists and of our discernment as Christians is not in our acknowledgement of that which is already widely accepted, but in our ability to correctly identify present truths. The Pharisees claim to accept ancient prophets while rejecting the living Christ of whom the prophets testified. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow we know not from whence he is. Many professed scholars today are happy to claim the mantle of science